Purgatory, Part 2, Chapter 32 Relief of the Holy Souls We have seen the resources and the numerous means which Divine Mercy has placed in our hands for relieving the souls in Purgatory. But what souls are in those expiatory flames, and to what souls should we give our assistance? For what souls should we pray and offer our suffrages to God? These questions we must answer that we should pray for the souls of all the faithful departed, according to the expression of the Church. Although filial piety imposes special duties upon us which regards to parents and relations, Christian charity commands us to pray for all the faithful departed in general, because they are all our brethren in Jesus Christ, all our neighbors whom we must love as ourselves. By these words, faithful departed, the church means all those who actually in purgatory, that is to say, those who are neither in hell nor as yet worthy to be admitted into the glory of paradise. But who are these souls? Can we know them? God has reserved this knowledge to himself, and except as far as he is pleased to show us, we should remain in total ignorance of the state of the souls in the other life. Now, he really makes known that a soul is in purgatory or in the glory of heaven. Still more rarely does he reveal the reprobation of a soul. In this uncertainty, we must pray in general, as does the church. For all of the departed, without prejudice to those souls whom we wish to aid in particular. We may evidently restrict our intention to those among the dead who are still in need of our assistance, if God grants us the privilege which he accorded to St. Andrew Avellino of knowing the condition of the souls in the other life. When this holy religious of the order of the Threatines was accorded to his pious custom, praying with angelic fervor for the departed, it sometimes happened that he experienced within himself a sort of resistance, a feeling of invincible repulsion at other times it was, on the contrary, a great consolation, a particular attraction. He soon understood the meaning of these different impressions. The first signified that his prayer was useless, that the souls which he desired to assist was unworthy of mercy and condemned to eternal fire. The other indicated that his prayer was efficacious for the relief of a soul in purgatory. It was the same when he wished to offer the holy sacrifice for someone deceased. He felt on leaving the sacristy as though withheld by an irresistible hand, and understood that the soul was in hell. But when he was inundated with joy, light, and devotion, he was sure of contributing to the deliverance of his soul. This charitable saint prayed, therefore, with the greatest fervor for the dead, whom he knew to be suffering, and ceased not to apply his suffrages until the soul came to thank him, giving him the assurance of their deliverance. As for us, who have not these supernatural lights, we must pray for all the departed, even for the greatest sinners and that of the most virtuous Christians. St. Augustine knew the great virtue of his mother, St. Monica. Nevertheless, not content with offering his own suffrages for her to God, he asked his readers not to cease recommending her soul to divine mercy. As regard great sinners who die without being outwardly reconciled with God, we may not exclude them from our suffrages, because we have not the certainty of their interior impenitence. Faith teaches us that all men dying in the state of mortal sin incur eternal damnation. But who are those that in reality die in that state? God alone who reserves to himself the judgment of the living and the dead knows this. As to ourselves, we can but draw a conjectural conclusion from exterior circumstances, and from even this we must refrain. It must, however, be confessed that there is everything to be feared for those who die unprepared for death, and all hope seems vanish for those who refuse to receive the sacraments. The latter quit this life with exterior signs of reprobation. Nevertheless, we must leave the judgments to God, according to the words, To God belongs judgment. There is more to be hoped for those who are not positively hostile to religion, 
who are benevolent towards the poor, and who retain some practice of Christian piety, or who at least approve and favor piety. There is more, I say, to hope for such persons when it happens that they die suddenly, without having the time to receive the last sacraments of the Church. St. Francis de Sales will not have us despair of the conversion of sinners until their last breath. And even after their death, he forbids us to judge evil of those who have led a bad life. With the exception of those sinners who reprobation made manifest by Holy Scripture, we may not, he says, conclude that a person is damned, but must respect the secret of God. His principal reason was that as the first grace is gratuitous, so also is the last, which is final perseverance or a good death. This is why we must hope for the departed, how sad soever his death may have been, because our conjectures can be based on the exterior only, whereby the most clever may be deceived. Purgatory, Part 2, Chapter 33 Relief of the Holy Souls Father Ravigan, an illustrious and holy preacher of the Society of Jesus, also cherished great hope for the welfare of sinners carried away by a sudden death, when otherwise they had borne no hatred in the heart for the things of God. He lived to speak of the supreme moment, and it seems to have been his opinion that many sinners are converted at the last moments and are reconciled to God without being able to give an exterior sign thereof. In certain deaths there are mysteries of mercy, where the eye of man sees nothing but strokes of justice. As a last glimmer of light, God sometimes reveals himself to those souls whose greatest misfortune has been to ignore him. And the last sigh understood by him who penetrates hearts may be a groan that calls for pardon, that is to say, an act of perfect contrition. General Exelums, a relative of this good father was suddenly carried to the tomb by an accident, and unfortunately he had not been faithful in the practice of his religion. He had promised that he would one day make his confession, but had not the opportunity to do so. Father Raghavan, who for a long time had prayed and procured prayers for him, was filled with consternation when he heard of such a death. The same day a person accustomed to receive supernatural communications thought he heard an interior voice, which said to him, Who then knows the extent of God's mercy? Who knows the depth of the ocean, or how much water is contained therein? Much will be forgiven in those who have sinned through ignorance. The biographer whom we borrow this incident, Father de Polonavoy, goes to say, Christians place under the law of hope no less than under the law of faith and charity. We must continually lift ourselves up from the depths of our sufferings to the thoughts of the infinite goodness of God. No limit to the grace of God is placed here below. While there remains a spark of life, there is nothing which it cannot affect in the soul. Therefore we must ever hope and petition God with humble persistency. We know not to what degree we may be heard. Great saints and doctors have gone to great length in extolling the powerful efficacy of prayer for their dearly departed. How unhappy soever their end may have been, we shall one day know the unspeakable marvels of divine mercy. We should never cease to implore it with the greatest confidence. The following incident took place in November 1880. A religious preaching a mission to the ladies of Nancy, and reminded them in a conference that we must never despair of the salvation of a soul, and that sometimes actions of the least importance in the eyes of men are rewarded by God at the hour of death. When he was about to leave the church, a lady dressed in mourning approached him and said, Father, you just recommended to us confidence and hope. What has just happened to me fully justifies your words. I had a husband who was most kind and affectionate, 
and who, although otherwise leading an irreproachable life, entirely neglected the practice of his religion. My prayers and exhortations remained without effect. During the month of May, which preceded his death, I had erected in my room, as I was accustomed to do so, a little altar to the Blessed Virgin, and decorated it with flowers, which I renewed from time to time. My husband passed the Sunday in the country, and each time he returned he brought me some flowers, which he himself had plucked, and with these I used to adorn my oratory. Did he notice this? Did he do this to give me pleasure, or is it through a sentiment of piety towards the Blessed Virgin? I know not, but he never failed to bring me the flowers. In the beginning of the following month, he died suddenly, without having any time to receive the consolations of religion. I was inconsolable, especially as I saw all my hopes of his return to God vanish. In consequence of my grief, my health became completely shattered, and my family urged me to take an hour in the south. As I had passed through Lyons, I desired to see the Curiars. I therefore wrote to him asking an audience, and recommending to his prayers my husband, who had died suddenly. I gave him no further details. Arrived at ours, scarcely had entered the venerable cure's room, than to my great astonishment he addressed me in these words, Madame, you are disconsolate. But have you forgotten those banquet of flowers which were brought to you each Sunday on the month of May? It is impossible to express my astonishment on hearing M. Viani remind me of a circumstance that I had not mentioned to anyone, and which he could only know by revelation. He continued, God has mercy on him who honored his holy mother. At the moment of his death, your husband repented. His soul is in purgatory. Your prayers and good works will obtain his deliverance. We read in the life of a holy religious, Sister Catherine of St. Augustine, that the place where she lived, there was a woman named Mary, who in her youth had given herself up to a very disorderly life, and as age brought no amendment, but, on the contrary, she grew more obstinate in vice, the inhabitants, no longer willing to tolerate the scandal she gave, drove her from the city. She found no other asylum than the grotto in the forest, where after a few months she died without the assistance of the sacraments. Her body was interred in a field, as though it were something contagious. Sister Mary Catherine, who was accustomed to recommend to God the souls of all those whose death she heard, thought not of praying for this one, judging as it everyone else did, that she was surely damned. Four months later, the servant of God heard a voice saying, Sister Catherine, how unfortunate I am. You recommend to God the souls of all. I am the only one you take no pity. Who then are you? replied the sister. I am the poor Mary who died in the grotto. What, Mary, are you saved? Yes. By the divine mercy I am, at the point of death, terrified by the remembrance of my crimes, and seeing myself abandoned by all, I call upon the Blessed Virgin, and in her tender goodness she heard me, and obtained for me the grace of perfect contrition, with a desire of confessing, had it been in my power to do so. I thus recovered the grace of God and escaped hell, but I was obliged to go to purgatory, where I suffer terribly, my time will be shortened, and I shall soon be liberated if a few masses are offered for me. Oh, have them celebrated for me, dear sister, and I shall ever remember you before Jesus and Mary. Sister Catherine hastened to fulfill this request, and after a few days the soul again appeared, brilliant as a star, and returning thanks for her charity. Purgatory, Part 2, Chapter 34, Motives of Assisting the Holy Souls We have just passed in review the means and resources which Divine Mercy has placed on our hands 
for the relief of our brethren in purgatory. These means are powerful. The resource is rich. But do we make an abundant use thereof? Having it in our power to assist the poor souls, have we enough zeal to do so? Are we as rich in charity as God is rich in his mercy? Alas, how many Christians do so little or nothing for the departed? And those who forget them not, those who have sufficient charity to aid them by their suffrages, how often are they not lacking in zeal and fervor? Compare the care we bestow upon the sick with the assistance which we give to the suffering souls. When a father or mother is afflicted with some malady, when a child or a person dear to us is prey to her suffering, what care, what solicitude, what devotion on our part? But the holy souls, who are no less dear to us, languish under the weight, not of a painful malady, but of expiatory torments a thousand times more cruel. Are we equally fervent to solicitude, eager to procure for them relief? No, says Father Francis de Sales, we do not sufficiently remember our dearly departed friends. Their memory seems to perish with the sound of the funeral bells, and we forget that the friendship which finds an end, even in death, was never a genuine friendship. From whence this sad and culpable forgetfulness? Its principal cause is want of reflection, because there is none that considereth in the heart. We lose sight of the great motives which urge us to exercise of this charity towards the dead. It is therefore to stimulate our zeal that we are about to recall to mind these motives, and to place them in the strongest possible light. We may say that all these motives are summed up in these words of the Holy Ghost. It is a holy and wholesome thought to pray for the dead, that they may be loosed from their sins, that is, from the temporal punishment due to their sins. 2 Maccabees 12.46 In the first place, it is a work holy and excellent in itself, as also agreeable and meritorious in the sight of God. Accordingly, it is a salutary work, extremely profitable to our own salvation, for our welfare in this world and in the next. One of the holiest works, one of the best exercises of piety that we can practice in this world, says St. Augustine, is to offer sacrifices, alms, and prayers for the dead. The relief which we procure for the departed, says St. Jerome, obtains for us a like mercy. Considered in itself, prayer for the dead is a work of faith, charity, and frequently even justice. First, who are indeed the persons whom there is question of assisting? Who are those holy, predestined souls, so dear to God and to our Lord Jesus Christ, who so dear to their mother, the Church, who unceasingly recommends them to our charity? Souls who are dear also to ourselves, and were perhaps intimately united to us upon earth, and who supplicate us in these touching words, Have pity on me, have pity on me, at least you my friends. Job 19.21 Second, in what necessities do they find themselves? Alas, the necessity being very great, the souls who thus suffer have a right to our assistance proportionate to their utter haplessness to do anything for themselves. Third, what good do we procure for the souls? The greatest good, since we put them in possession of eternal beatitude. To assist the holy souls in purgatory, says St. Francis de Sales, is to perform the most excellent of the works of mercy, or rather, it is to practice in a most sublime manner all the works of mercy together. It is to visit the sick. It is to give drink to those who thirst for the vision of God. It is to feed the hungry, to ransom prisoners, to clothe the naked, to procure for the poor exiles the hospitality of the heavenly Jerusalem. It is to comfort the afflicted, to instruct the ignorant, in fine, to practice all the works of mercy in one.
This doctrine agrees very well with that of St. Thomas, who says in his Summa, Suffrages for the dead are more agreeable to God than suffrages for the living, because the former stand in more urgent need thereof, not being able to assist themselves, as are the living. The Lord regards every work of mercy exercised towards our neighbor as done to himself. It is to me, says he, that you have done it. This is most especially true of mercy practiced towards the poor souls. It was revealed to St. Bridget that he who delivers a soul from purgatory has the same merit as if he delivered Jesus Christ himself from captivity.